So good morning to the new people who just arrived and to everyone else who was already here. Uh, we're at the third presentation now. Uh, Julia Teisel from Vienna University uh, is here to give her experiences about using ADA in a, in a novel project in autonomous time, uh, train control. Sorry, and um, there's a lot to say about that. So I will give the floor to you. Thank you. Welcome to my presentation about autonomous contr train control system. It was the first approach. Uh, why am I using ADA and why am I programming, am I programming things for autonomous trains? I was an, a student of embedded systems engineering at FA Campus Wien in Vienna and my lecturer came to me and said, oh, I heard you're interested in autonomous cars, they are so complicated, so why not autonomous trains? It's easier and there's a very beautiful programming language and there's an IDE for the Raspberry Pi so why not? Um, I was a bit sick of writing C code and of pointers and <laughs> all that stuff so I said why not give it a try and so I was introduced to the Ausodots project it means autonome schienengebundene on-demand open track systeme very catchy name, I know. <laughs> um, in English it means Autonomous Rail Bound On Demand Open Track Systems. It's a project by the Vienna Institute of Safety and Systems Engineering at FA Campus Wien and it's funded by the Magistral Department for Economics, Job Market and Innovation Policy Aspects and Statistics. Also a catchy <laughs> name. So as you see Austrians are not that good in naming things. <laughs> The EMA 23, so the Magistral Department, is uh, funding a lot of college, university and research projects in Vienna. So, what are the project ob objectives? They want to create a safety concept for development and application of Ausodots. They want to check if the existing standards, for example the Tenelec standard, can be applied for Ausodots and they want to perform an analyze and risk assessment. So autonomous and rail bound, there are special requirements for different things. For the vehicles, vehicles it means um, they have to approach, uh, they have to monitor the approaching area because if there is something on the track it's not good that the train is continuing his drive. Um, there must be communication be between the cabins there must be communication with the control center and the intersections and um, then there are special requirements for the control center um, it must schedule the cabins and the calls it must create a priority allocation there must be track monitoring and there must be intersection monitoring and also performing emergency actions if necessary there are also special requirements for the stations. There must be station monitoring regarding safety and security concerns because if somebody is hacking your camera system, it uh, concerns the safety of your passengers. There must be platform and platform edge monitoring and there must be information about arriving and departing vehicles and there must be communication with the control center. What means on-demand and what is so special about on-demand? Normally trains have a fixed schedule. This is not um, the part of our system. Our system um, in our system a cabin drives only to a station if somebody needs a cabin right now. It's like an horizontal elevator, so you press a button, a cabin is coming. There are two push buttons per station which decide in which direction you want to drive and there are push buttons inside each cabin like an elevator where you can say I want to go out here or I want to go out on the next station um, and you have to place trains along the track to reduce waiting time because if you have two terminals in a very large distance from each other and somebody is calling a cabin in the middle of the track this person doesn't want to wait half an hour for a cabin. 
So, open track. What is an open track? To explain what an open track is, I first explain what closed tracks are. Closed tracks are completely closed off. As the name says, there are tunnels or fences or walls around it. Um, there is no interaction with cars, bicycles or pedestrians and seldom there is oncoming traffic. A good example is the Rubin project. It's the autonomous subway in Nuremberg. Regarding open track systems, it's a bit um, different. The track is not closed off. So, for example, if the track is next to a forest and a tree falls down, you have to um, check if, if there is something on the track or there could be a cow walking along your track and saying, oh, that's fine. <laughs> that's a good place to stand and chew. Um, also, there is interaction with cars, bicycles and pedestrians because there will be intersections. And um, if it's a single track, there will be oncoming traffic. The railway network, also the situation, the actual situation in Austria is that 50% uh, of all tracks in Austria are single track branch lines. 50% of these branch lines are not electrified. And um, most of these branch lines are underexploited and um, or shut down because of high operational costs and declining passenger numbers. So we need a new solution. We are searching for a new solution and we hope our project will be the new solution. Um, one project location would be um, the Valley of Durelising. It connects the outskirts of Vienna to Kaltenleutgeben, which is a small town next to Vienna. There are five stations. Some parts are next to a forest. Um, it was in the 1950s that the passenger transport was shut down and in 2014 the last train drove to a cement plant. Then they closed the track completely, but in the last years a lot of houses were built there and there is only one road inside the, the valley. So in the mornings and in the evenings when the people go to work or are coming from work, they are standing in a traffic jam. There is one public transport, it's a bus. The bus is also standing in the traffic, in the traffic jam. Um, but still the Austrian Railway Foundation says no, it's not cost effective to uh, re-establish the connection. So we hope that uh, our system will be not that expensive and will give the people an opportunity of public transport. So, what was my part in the whole system? I had to build a model railway. Easy. People are doing this in their free time, can't be so hard. Program autonomous on-demand systems, an autonomous on-demand system. Shouldn't be that hard either. And uh, finding the optimal position for passing loops since most of the track is uh, a single track. Yeah, two years later, I finished my master thesis, so it was a bit hard. Um, this is my model railway. Well, picture looks good. Um, <laughs> it's um, close to the track in Kaltenleutgeben, but I had to build a spiral since my space was a bit limited. Um, my system architect architecture consists of nine different things. I will explain them in detail later. The track, the trains, an ASU command station, uh, a microcontroller, an STM32 F1, LEDs, push buttons, two Raspberry Pis, a switch, and a laptop. So normally, uh, the railway system works with blocks. Blocks are um, segments of a track. And normally in front of each block you have two signals, a pre-signal and a main signal. 
The pre-signal indicates what is probably going to happen, and the main signal indicates if the next block is free or occupied. This is state of, state of the art. This is what the Tinelec standard required, requires. But uh, since I didn't want to build a normal railway system, I developed my own safety concept to avoid collisions. I divided my track into sections. Um, between the red dots are the possibilities for a train to stop. And a section is going from, for example, here to here. Each section has a start point, a centerpiece, and an end point. And if, for example, a train wants to um, reserve a section, it has to look if all the other sections with the same centerpiece are also free. Because, for example, if a train wants to drive from here to here, another train could be driving from here to here, and they are using the same centerpiece. And since it's single track, it would be um, an and a collision would occur. So these are my rail cars. They are looking very old fashioned, but these were the only cars with a passenger compartment and a toilet. Uh, Inside the train, you can see a lot of cables. They are connected to an MX632 um, decoder, which um, converts the signals which are transported along the tracks into a protocol that the train understands. Then you have the ASU command station, which is normally the heart of a model railway because you can perform all the actions you want. You can switch turnouts, you can uh, set the train speed, and so on. I used it as an expensive converter because it <laughs> converts the DCC railcom format uh, protocol to IP packages, which were easier to handle. So it's a 600 euro converter. <laughs> um, and I'm using it to test things because I was new to model railways so I used it to test if my track is working, if my turnouts are switching and so on. Then I'm having an STM32 F1 microcontroller and LEDs. The software is written in C. At the moment I tried to programmed the software with my students in ADA, but we had some problems with ADA on microcontrollers. Um, the microcontroller receives commands via UART, acknowledges each command, and then uses a PVM signal to control the LEDs. We designed and 3D printed the cases ourselves and glued some RGB LEDs inside. And I divided, um, I positioned several LEDs along the track and I, and I divided them into four different lines. The two terminal stations, <coughs> the stations at the passing loops, the stations on the single track, and we have an, an intersection with uh, the track. So. The push buttons, each station has two push buttons to determine in which direction you want to go. Um, if the LED is turned on inside the push button, it indicates that a train call is in process and it, the LED is turned off when the train arrives at the station. We have a control Raspberry Pi, which is the system's brain. It knows everything, it's, it decides everything, and the software is written in ADA, why I'm here today. Um, I will talk about it in detail later. Then we have the message Raspberry Pi. The software is written in C Sharp, also by a colleague of mine. It handles all the messages inside the system between the control Raspberry Pi, the ASU command station, the STM32 
and the push buttons. Then we have a switch because I had a lot of Ethernet connections and a laptop to debug the message Raspberry Pi <coughs> and start the server application because there was no screen attached to both Raspberry Pis. So this is the whole system architecture. You can see the track and the trains here. They are communicating with the ACOS. The ACOS is um, translating the DCC Railcom protocol into IP packages. The IP packages are then sent to the message Raspberry Pi, which analyzes them and sends them to the control Raspberry Pi. We have the laptop to start the server application and watch the output. Then we have the STM32, which is connected to the signals and the push buttons attached to the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. There is the possibility to push uh, an emergency stop button because each um, safety critical system should have an emergency stop which can be um, pushed from the outside. Um, it cuts the power supply of the ACOS and there is also the possibility to um, make a hardware stop via software when the control Raspberry Pi says okay I have to perform an emergency action and the emergency action is to cut the power of the ACOS so no train is moving. Looks very clean and nice, yeah. <laughs> This is, what, this is what happens when a software engineer starts soldiering for the first time. <laughs> and uh, a problem was that I had to build the system on two plates because the idea was it has to be transportable. It was never transported, <laughs> but it had to be. Um, so I had to design connectors, yeah, requirements. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of work. Okay, the control Raspberry Pi software. We have eight ADA packages, one C and a header file, um, and seven tasks. There is the communication task, the reading interface task, and for each train, a task. So five tasks because I have five trains at the moment on the track. The communication task starts all the other tasks establishes a connection to the message Raspberry Pi, which is acting as a server, analyzes all the messages, and forwards the messages to the train tasks. What means analyzing a message? It dissembles the received string, decides if, for example, a push button was pressed, or the message, a message is coming from the ACOS, or if it is an acknowledgement from the STM32. If a push button was pressed, the software has to select a train. I can't select every train. I have to decide, is there a train already driving in the direction of the station? And is it possible for the train to stop at the station? If not, which train is closest. If there are two trains in the same distance, I have to choose the one with the least operating hours because I assume that after a certain amount of operating hours, each train has to be serviced. So it would be good if all the trains had at least approximately the same amount of operating hours. So, and if the message is coming from the ACOS, I have to look which train is waiting for an acknowledgement or which train is, as a train task is waiting for a message. Uh, the reading interface task is very short. It reads all the messages coming from the message Raspberry Pi and pushes them into a queue where they are read by the communication task. So, the train tasks. The train task starts when it is, for example, the closest to a station. The train is set as reserved. The end station is set depending on the button which was pressed. Um, and then I have to look, am I perhaps already standing at the station where the call came from? If yes, I can di directly set uh, the direction depending on the terminal station. 
If not, I have to drive first to the calling station. Then I have to search a section. I have to try to reserve it. If it works, fine. If not, the whole pr process is started again. At the moment, there is uh, no action if this is an infinite process. I have to change this because it's not very safe if uh, a train is searching and searching and searching and never becoming a section. Um, but if the reservation was successful, I can set the first turnout, wait for an acknowledgement. If there is a second turnout in the section, set the second turnout. Then I'm communicating with the STM32. Oh, I forgot to say, my signals only indicate if a section was reserved successfully and the train starts to drive. So. If a section is reserved successfully, the signal will turn green while all the other signals are turned red. Except the intersection where it's the other way around. If a train is driving through the section with the intersection, the signals for the cars turn red. So first we have to decide which light line we want to choose, then set the LED numbers. This can be one LED or all the LEDs of the line. We can choose a color and then we have to look if um, the crossing light is needed and if yes, we have to repeat the whole process for the crossing line. Then we set the light inside the train to indicate that the train will start now. Then we set the train direction and finally we can start to drive. Uh, we increase the operating hours, then we have to, to wait if the centerpiece is reached within time. If yes, we have to wait if the next station is reached within time. If no, we perform an emergency stop where we cut the power of the acres so all trains have to stop. Because I decided if an autonomous system fails, there must be a human interaction to guarantee freedom of errors. Because it's not possible, I decided that it's not possible um, that the system corrects itself. Um, if we reach the next station, we reset the light, so we turn the green light to red, we free the section so another train can use the section. And uh, then we have to look, are we already at the terminal station? If not, we have to repeat the whole process for the next section. If yes, we set the train speed to zero, we free the train and turn off the light again and wait for the next call. So, special features of ADA, which I really enjoyed, I really liked, and uh, they are the, re the reason why I don't want to program in any other language than in ADA. Once you start, you never can stop. Um, creating your own data types. It really helps to map the real world to your code, and it helps to prevent um, Assigning variable, bigger or smaller variables, uh, uh, it helps to so um, values outside of the skirt of your variables cannot be assigned. So you can be sure that only values that you want to be assigned are assigned to your variables. Protected types. Really beautiful thing if uh, different tasks are using the same functions because, for example, the function for reserving a train shouldn't be used by different tasks at the same time. It will, ca it will cause problems. Uh, rendezvous, which is the um, synchronization and communication mechanism between tasks. I really liked it because it's very beautiful to use. Records, which are like structs, easy to use, beautiful to use, and procedure parameters. I really like that it's possible to assign as many parameters as I want to assign. 
to a procedure. I can have three in parameters, five out parameters if I want to. I don't have to use a structure, I don't have to use a pointer. I can map whatever I want to my code. So, a uh, short demonstration. I already had to detach the light because I needed them for another project. Um, you will see. Um, I decided that there has always that there must always be a train waiting here to reduce the waiting time, and if this train starts, another p train has to take its place. So, hopefully, it starts. Yes. So I'm calling a train to a station. The train starts. It starts to drive. You will see here another train starting. The first train arrives at the station. It waits a short amount of time and then drives to this terminal station. Now something really, really bad happens because the train with the passengers inside has to wait until this train passes the single track. Bad design, didn't thought about it, but the next version will um, look at this so that if two trains uh, want to use the same single section, um, the train without passengers inside has to wait until all other trains with passengers inside um, passes. And if there are two trains with passengers inside, I have to look at the amount that uh, the trains have already taken during their drive and the amount they probably will take and the one with the smaller amount um, has to wait. So, what's next? That's my next track. Looks nice. Um, these are 46.775 square meters. My old track had uh, 4.2 square meters. It's a bit bigger. Um, but since numbers are numbers, and I, it's hard for me to map them to the real world, here's a picture. In the background, you can see half of my old track. And since it's also difficult to see how really big it is, <laughs> that's me standing on it. So, but... Uh, Playing with model railways is not my job. I'm a software engineer, so what will the next software version look like? Uh, I want to write most of the code in Spark. Spark is uh, the part you use for safety applications, the part of ADA you use in safety applications. Uh, I want to customize the scheduling algorithm to reduce waiting time and to reduce traveling time. We will see if a Raspberry Pi is fast enough. Uh, I also want to distribute in the intelligence so every train becomes its own controller and a lot of sensors around it so each train can decide if it's safe to drive or not. And then we, s we will see how many unnecessary <laughs> lines of code I wrote. Uh, these are the sources of the pictures. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yes. How long is the track I never measured it. <laughs> I don't know. But it maps, um, there's a track in Austria from Oberwart to uh, Pinkerfeld, which says nothing if you don't live in Austria. Um, about, in the real world, 30 kilometers. And it's uh, 1 to 87 if you map it to, to a model railway. Um, one of the problems you might face could be deadlock prevention. Do you, uh, do you plan for that already? Uh, yes. Because yes. all your three posts at the end are full and for some reason a fourth 
yes. the car arrives, you have a deadlock. Um, we have different solutions. We're not sure which one will be the best, but uh, there is a possibility to, to move trains. Not my On the next track, I will not use sections this big. The sections are really, really small. They are, for example, on, on this track, you have five sections where you can stop. And um, trains are allowed to move one step behind so the next train can okay. approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you test how many cabins you need per passenger or how many passengers <coughs> can fit into that system? Um, it kind of breaks because there are too many. We didn't test it. But uh, the cabins will hold 15 to 20 passengers. Can you estimate how many? No. We have to test it. We started two years ago, and uh, now there's one cabin. <laughs> and we, we, we have to start testing. And you have to see if uh, the passengers are willing to, tra to take the train because it's always difficult with autonomous systems that uh, the passengers are willing to use them. And in Austria, it's especially difficult because what is new is mm, we don't want to use it. <laughs> and if it's autonomous, it's even more mm. so, so it's difficult. Okay. Another question there? Yeah, if you have uh, multiple cabins going to the same direction, would you go for an option to combine them into a train? No. Um, the question, if I understood it right, was to combine cabins to a train if there are um, many calls. No, we don't want to do that. Um, we will look if, for example, in the morning there are a lot of calls. We um, want to switch to a fixed schedule instead of a demand option. And a demand, if you push a button and call a train, it doesn't mean that the train is coming immediately. It means there are between 10 and 5 minutes waiting time. So you can look if there are other people or other passengers calling a train. You mentioned you had problems uh, using ADA on the STM. Microphone. Yes. What were the problems? Um, I didn't get the, the runtime running. Run yes, yes. But it's a problem I hopefully will fix today. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who wants yeah. to go first. Okay, yes. So uh, you were saying that you are trying to distribute the logic on yes. the track. Yes. So are you trying? Are you planning to di distribute sensors on the track and have the logic distributed? And mm -hmm. on that matter, also in the beginning of the presentation, you talked about um, that you may have open tracks yes. where you may have obstacles on the track. This is an open track. Uh, yes. So on that matter, are you also thinking on any kind of, of solution to to detect those obstacles and have some? Um, we will have uh, special sensors on the intersection, on the intersections to detect, for example, cars approaching or uh, pedestrians approaching. And on the trains, we will test radar, ultrasonic, and oh my god, I forgot the third. Um, leader. Leader, thank you. Yes. And we have to see what solution is the best or if we have to combine all three methods. And uh, we want to use uh, machine learning algorithms to monitor uh, the stations. And are you already working on projects with real uh, units or just... Um, not me, but colleagues of me, yes. Uh, and I, my system is for, for testing the scheduling algorithms and do a few tests with sensors. Thank you. There was a question there. Uh, does the system uh, take into account the profile of trucks? Because different vehicles can uh, move with different speed, depends on, uh, for example, uh, uh, incline, decline. Yes. 
and arrive at different speeds. So we count it, and you decide what truck should be moved close to the section. Y yes. Um, for this track, it's very easy because it's in the Burgenland, and the Burgenland is plain. <laughs> So, um, but the, the first um, track I showed, the, the Carlton Lloyd game track, there we have big problems because there's a huge uh, Steigerung, um, decline, thank you, um, and we have to test it. At the moment, we have one real cabin and it's uh, driving in, in the Burgenland and, and not at the, other, at the other track, so we have to test if it's working. When, when you were testing your software, yes. how many collisions have you seen? <laughs> None. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Block-oriented safety is a very old concept. Yes. However, it's very effective. Uh, do you see a chance to replace it by something smoother, which takes into account the, the speeds of the trains and the distances? There is something, it's called moving blocks. Um, we want to adapt it, but it's difficult with the standard because the railway standard is very strict and the people in Austria are very strict concerning the standards. So we will see if we have to m use moving blocks or if we are allowed to create something new. Right now you're, you're, you're creating a heuristics of, of this small track, right? And you have that one set of strategy. Um, what do you think, how, how well is that going to scale to a real large train system that connects in many places? Is that going to be very complicated to come up with the right heuristics? I never thought about it. <laughs> it was a, a first approach. We tested it with one track. We will see if my software is working with a bigger track. But it's not planned to replace the whole railway network in Austria. It's we just want to replace the, the branch lines, with, which are not very used very frequently. So it's not planned for, for the whole railway system. So many questions. Yes. <laughs> When I press a button to ask for a train, yes. or when I'm in a train, and yes. I press a button for a destination, yes. can the scheduler algorithm predict and show me the time uh, of arrival? Not right now, but okay. it will. But it depends always if um, you are, I don't know, at the third station, and you are driving in this direction, and there are in between two stations, it can't predict if passengers want to um, yep. step in at the two stations. But there will be... Uh, Meantime, yes, yes, something like this. You said you had a colleague that uh, programmed their part in C or in C sharp. Yes. So did you have exchanges on the merits of your respective approaches and underlying technologies? Excuse me. Did you, have exchange, did you exchange on the merits of each technology and what it brings? No. No, um, because uh, they had the fixed idea not to use ADA. <laughs> 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 and I couldn't convince them, so, yeah. Maybe you can show them this talk? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> um, one there? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned in your next version you will be using Spark. And the question is what level of Spark are you planning to? Just freedom of exceptions? So basically runtime, no runtime hours? Or will you go the whole way to actually prove functional correctness? I want to prove functional correctness. Because it's required for a safety application. Yeah, that's what I've yeah. 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 What's the question? Uh, you only ha your system only has one brain. Yes. One CPU there that, um, so if that fails, then you're done for. So presumably you're going to plan to have multiple <laughs> processors and yes. somehow have redundancy of tasks. Yes. So when um, not redundancy of tasks, but there will be an. Uh, uh, supervisor looking if everything goes right and if it detects a failure then there will also be an, an emergency stop so we will we'll have redundancy 
Well, I imagine this stop seems a bit dramatic when... Yeah, but that's, that's uh, in normal railways, that's the way it goes. Now, in normal railways, you have multiple systems so that if one computer fails... Yes. ...it continues. So yeah, but that's only a model. Yeah, in, in the real world, yeah. there will be multiple computers. But I don't design the real system, so I'm, I'm not sure, and it's not designed yet. So we are testing different solutions and we will see what will be the, the best solution. So I can't tell how many computers there will be. But of course there must be redundancy. More here. Uh, not really a question, but since you mentioned the, the, this idea of the horizontal elevator, the university in Prague has something that surprised me. It was as an elevator, but instead of asking for direction and then going into the ele ele elevator and asking for your story, mm -hmm. they have the buttons to choose the story outside already. Okay. So basically the system knows beforehand where you want to go. Okay. So maybe that helps you also, so you know where the passengers actually want to go. But if what the if the passenger inside the cabin gets a call and wants to go out at another station? Of course, it's just, I mean, I think yeah. most of the time you will go where you want to go. Yeah. Thank you. I can only re reinforce what he said. This is really the future of elevators. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have this elevator. So it exists already. Yeah, they exist, but it oh, will be yeah. the future of elevators. Okay. Yeah, we still have a few minutes. Okay, so um, I don't know if I missed it, but uh, I was wondering. Um, you are building all these giant model trains. Uh, is there any reason why you are not using some kind of simulator or trying to work on having a simulator for that? Yes, because we have to convince politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and they need real buttons to press and see things moving around. I imagine that. Okay. So, but it, it, it would be interesting to have a, a simulator. So we also can... have a, a simulation. Oh, a yes, 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 of course. Do you have a set of requirements that you require that you need on the real tracks in order to do this? And have you evaluated the possible effort and cost <laughs> to retrofit what you need onto the existing tracks? No. Because existing tracks could no, because there at the moment there are no require as they are writing the requirements right now. Uh, and I will adapt my software to these requirements later. But I have to start with something. So, Maybe yes. A final yeah, no, no, only a, a One of my friends is a specialist for elevators, and he said <laughs> that there are tendencies to develop elevators which can not only move vertically but also horizontally. Yeah. So that uh, there will be a similarity between. Uh, trains and elevators in the future. On the flight, on the way here, I read something about elevators going in all directions. <laughs> okay. Thank you for an interesting Thank you.